Okay, um, I'm going to I'm going to begin a a couple of week series, I would guess, on something that I've preached before, but I've but I haven't preached it as extensively um, or as exhaustively, I guess you could say, as I intend to preach it this this morning and in subsequent weeks. Um, and that is on the prophecy that we find over in Daniel chapter 9. Um, it's known as the 70 weeks prophecy and it can get fairly confusing at times if you as we're going to see when we look at it but it is but but it outlines something that is that is so remarkable that God told us when the Messiah was going to come into into the world you see he doesn't tell us when he's going to return but he told us exactly when to expect Christ and people that were watching for him knew when the time was and so I want to go through that prophecy with you and show you how how that was laid out now the first thing I want you to do is a long read but we need to read it to get to get this started and that's um, Daniel chapter 1 because this gives us the background and the introduction that we need to start working on the prophecy that's in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto as as Pinaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. This was not uncommon when a when an ancient um, people would conquer another people, it was not uncommon for them to look around and find children of that other people that they could raise up in their, in their kingdom and teach their ways. It was not an un, uncommon thing to do at all. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Haniah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Haniah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. And I've gone over this before in, in other teaching and showed you that th these, are, these are tied into the names of the Babylonian gods. So he was giving them names that were attached to, to the, the gods of the Babylonians. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why, uh, why should he see your faces worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Um, then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. If I feed you something other than the best that I have to offer, you're not going to do as well as, as the others, and, and the king is going to spot it and see that you're, you're not doing well, right? And, and that's going to get me in trouble with the king because this is what he told me to do. He told me to feed you this. Then said Daniel to um, Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Haniah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. That's basically, it's like refried beans, I guess. It's basically just give us beans and water. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. 
and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days, and at the end of the ten days their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. They were doing better eating refried beans than they were eating steak. I wonder if there's a nutrition lesson in there somewhere. Not for me. I'm, I'm going to go back to eating steak. Um, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found... <clears throat> None like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. And in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, a couple of points I want you to, uh, that I want to make regarding this. Daniel was a Hebrew. He was referred to here as a child. Chances were that he was somewhere around 13 years old. Don't know exactly. Might have been a little younger, might have been a little older, but he, was, but he wasn't an infant, obviously. He could, he could address the king and talk to him, or he could address the eunuchs and talk to him, so he, he obviously wasn't a baby. He was, he was old enough to do that. He was taken captive when Nebuchadnezzar who was the king of Babylon, besieged Jerusalem and overcame it. Um, and owing to the wisdom, skill, and understanding that God gave to Daniel, far above all of the other magicians in the land and the, the astrologers, Daniel was preferred by the king and continued to be preferred by the kings that followed. Interesting thing about Daniel, he is, as far as tradition anyway, they, nobody really knows for sure, but it, it appears that he never returned to Jerusalem, that he actually died in what is now Iraq um, and is buried somewhere over there in the area where Babylon would have been. Now, you, you've considered the fact that this was a 70-year captivity, and if he was 13 years old when they were taken captive, <coughs> he was 83 years old at the end of the 70 years. So. He wasn't a young he wasn't a young kid at that point. He was, and and so who knows when exactly he died? I don't know, um, but that's what uh, um, that's that's what tradition has it that his grave is somewhere in in Babylon. He spent the entire seventy year captivity in Babylon. Was most likely in his early to mid eighties um, when Babylon was overtaken by Cyrus. Therefore, Daniel's prophecies were given to him during the time of Israel's captivity by the Babylonians and into the, the, the empire of the Medes and the Persians. Okay? Now, one thing that's interesting, and that is the Jews relegated Daniel to the writings in their, in their Bible. Um, in Matthew chapter 24... And verse 15, Christ says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, that's something that we'll be discussing in the, in the prophecy that we're going to be looking at. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. And then also in Mark chapter 13, we have another statement. Mark uh, chapter 13, where did I go here? And verse 14, we're talking, it's an, an, another part of the same prophecy. Um, but when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. The, 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 the point that I'm trying to make here is that the, the, the Hebrews do not consider Daniel to be a prophet. They, they assigned him a section within their Bible in the writings, not in the prophets. Okay? And the reason is because his prophecies weren't necessarily to the Jewish people. 
That's what they will tell you. Um, but the prophecies in Daniel are so exact that many, many liberals have come to the conclusion that somebody wrote this after the fact. That it wasn't written by Daniel at all. That it was written years and years later because how else could it have been so exact? Well, I'll tell you how it could be that exact. God told him what to write. And God knows how, how things are going to play out. The, but the Jews relegated him to the, um, to the prophets. If you go get a Hebrew Bible, or not the prophets, to the writings. If you get a Hebrew Bible, you will find that he's not in the section known as the prophets. The Hebrew Bible is broken down different. Their Old Testament is broken down differently than ours. If you look at a Hebrew Old Testament, it does not have the same sections in it that our Old Testament has. Okay? It's broken down by the law, the prophets, and the writings. Three sections. Okay? So you have the law, which is the first five books, the Pentateuch, Moses. You have the, uh, the prophets, which are the prophetical books, and then you have the Psalms and Proverbs and all of those things that are considered Job. And Daniel is mixed in with that in, in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Now, this is an interesting point. Again, there are those that teach that Jesus Christ carried a Septuagint Bible around, a Greek translation of, of the Old Testament, most people that carry new Bibles believe that Jesus Christ had a Septuagint, that he taught from the Septuagint, that he did not teach from the Hebrew Bible. Um, because most of the new Bibles rely on the Septuagint for their Old Testament. Um, but it's interesting that the Septuagint book order is different from the Hebrew book order. In fact, our, new, our Old Testament, in our English Bible, the book order of the Old Testament follows the book order of the Septuagint, not the Hebrew Bible. Okay? So if you look at an English, or you look at a King James Bible, you will, you will see that we have, first we have the Pentateuch, the law, then after that we have what we call the historical books beginning with Joshua and going all the way through Ezra and Nehemiah then we have the um, poetical books which would include Job and um, the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and, and so on and then we have major and minor prophets now the major prophets that does not mean that they're any better than the others it just means they're bigger major prophets have well the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters in it some of the minor prophets are only one chapter long so it's broken down by major and minor only by size but that's the book order that you find in the Septuagint it is not the book order that you find in a Hebrew Bible okay you say well where are you going with all this I want you to look at Luke chapter 24 and I want to close the door on this idea that Jesus Christ carried around a Greek Bible Luke chapter 24 because he refers to it Luke 24 44 And as he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. That's a Hebrew Bible broken down by the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms or the writings. That is not the way a Septuagint lays out. Septuagint lays out exactly the same way that your Bible does. So Christ didn't carry a Septuagint around, he carried a Hebrew Bible around. Um, now, in Matthew chapter 2, and I'm going to mention this now and then I'll get back, I'm going to end up getting back to it. And 
I hope that I can get through the entire introduction this morning. I don't know if I will or not, to be, to be quite frank with you. I just, I don't know if I'll get there. It's pretty long. Um, so it, it may take more than one day, but, um, but I don't want to leave anything out. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now you've all heard the story of the Magi, right? The wise men that traveled from the east. Well, what, where do you think they were coming from? Got any ideas? Babylon? Wise men from the east traveling? How would they have any idea whatsoever that Christ was supposed to show up in around that time frame. I'll tell you, Daniel the prophet, the prophecy that we are going to look at gave us a specific time frame and they they revered Daniel more than their own magicians. We already read that in Daniel chapter 1. So not only was he a hero to the Jewish people as a prophet, well, Christ thought he was a prophet, but he was also a hero to the Babylonians. He was uh, very influential in the, in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and the kings that followed. So that's how these wise men had a clue that this, that how else would they know? They followed the prophecy of Daniel. And this prophecy, when we get there, it is so specific as were, as were all of them. When you, you, you know, you look at some of the prophecies that um, in the latter chapters of Daniel, when it's talking about the different world kingdoms and kings and such that are going to arise, and when you actually look at that and compare it to the historical record, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing how how accurate uh, it was. Um, now, in this study, we plan to pro to focus on prophecies of Daniel. Um, in which the Lord revealed these events that would happen on the international scene from the time of the ascendancy of the Medo-Persian Empire over Babylon around 456 BC, according to the Bible, I have to say, until the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, a period of roughly 525 years. That's what we're going to zero in on. Now, if, you, if your Bible is one that has dates in the center column reference, some of them do, some of them don't. If yours has dates in the center column reference and you look at those dates, you will probably most likely see a date that's different from what I just said. Okay? I just said that this started in 456 BC. If your Bible has dates in it, it probably says 538 BC. I want to explain why. Um, that's a difference of about 82 years. And I want to try to explain to you why it is that your Bible says something different from what I just said. And as we get into the prophecy, it will, it will make itself more clear. I wish I could put this all into one sentence, but I can't. We're, i got to go around and around and around and, and bring you back around to it again. Um, almost all Bibles that have dates, does anybody, do you have dates in them? Oh, I don't know why I'm beating a dead horse then. I could just ignore this part and move on, huh? Well, you might run across somebody that's got a Bible that's got dates in it. Um, and those dates are, they get those dates from a chronology that was put together by Bishop Usher in 1650 AD. Usher's chronology. Um, and that's where most of them get this. Now, I disagree with parts of Usher's chronology. And, and I will explain my reasons why. I know of other men that, that, that I look to that, are, that I'm very respectful of what they have done, um, but we disagree on this point. I want to explain why. Now, now, let me also say something else. This is not a test of fellowship. The, the real test on this is where the, where the prophecy ends, not where it starts. But, but I, I, I want to at least explain to you where I'm coming from so that you will understand why it is that I believe what I believe. Um, Usher's chronology, chronology, or his chronological system of dating, uh, indicates the fall of Babylon by the Medo Persian Empire to have occurred in 538 BC. Okay? And I'm saying it's all, he's off by 82 years. 
And here's the reasons why. Bishop Usher relied heavily upon something known as the Canon of Ptolemy uh, to determine the number and the length of the Persian kings from Cyrus the Great until Alexander the Great, the Grecian king that came in and overran the, the Medo Persians. So the Persian kings from the time of Cyrus until the last Persian king, in order to establish that time frame, Bishop Usher used what is known as the canon of, the canon of Ptolemy. Okay? Um, let me say this also. Within the Old Testament, now, it's not written out to where you can just read it. And you, I mean, it takes a lot of digging, but it's there. It is there. There is an unbroken and perfectly accurate chronology beginning with the day of creation and ending with the first year of Cyrus the Great. You start all those verses where you read about so and so was 110 and he begets somebody else, and you add all those numbers up and work your way all the way through and you have an unbroken, perfectly accurate chronology from creation all the way to Cyrus. And, and, the, um, and the end of that chronology is found in, in uh, Chronicles, uh, Second Chronicles, you don't need to turn here but you might want to write this down. Second Chronicles chapter 36 um, Beginning at verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Uh, then he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth have, hath the Lord uh, uh, God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people, the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Okay? There's an unbroken chronology that's absolutely perfect from creation to Cyrus. So we can calculate how many years it was from creation to Cyrus. And no one's in disagreement on this. Usher has it perfectly right. So do the other chronologies. They all They've all run the same numbers and they all end up with the same number of years for that period of time, okay? We have, within secular history, there is an absolutely perfect and accurate chronology from the last year of the Persian Empire. The overthrow of the Persian Empire by Alexander the Great until the present day. They started recording history about 60 years after Alexander the Great. The Greeks did it by method, by, by using the Olympiads. And from that point forward, history is complete. But there's one section that's dark. And that's the section of the Persian kings. The, the period from Cyrus the Great through Darius the Third nobody knows how long that period of time is nobody knows there's no historical data there are no writings there is nothing to hang your hat on to determine how long it is from Cyrus the Great until the end of Darius the third when Alexander the Great overtook him so we're perfect here, and we're perfect here, and we ain't got a clue as to that. Ptolemy tried to answer that question. That was what he was trying to do. Um, answer that missing period of time, which is in absolute darkness, and it cannot be determined from either a historical record or even from a chronology within the Bible. Um, so we got to come up with a different method and that's what Ptolemy tried to do and his system was adopted by just about everybody okay now let's let's consider the canon of Ptolemy it sets this period of time at 205 years with a total of 10 Persian kings covering that missing that missing period from Cyrus to Alexander 
Okay? He says it was 205 years and that there were 10 kings. He relied upon the mathematics of one Eratosthenes, who was a 2nd century BC Greek astronomer who relied upon eclipses and such to form his conclusions as to the length of the Persian kings and all of this is uncorroborated. So we have a, a Greek astronomer looking at eclipses that, uh, that occurred several hundred years before he was born to come up with how long the kings were there? That doesn't sound like something I'd want to hang my hat on. Um, especially considering that he's the only one that ever, he, there, there's no other witness. You got this guy. The Bible says in the mouth of two or more witnesses let every matter be established. Well, this guy comes up with this. Now, Ptolemy also used a vague Egyptian method of dating with a 365 day year. The Julian calendar is, calendar is 365 and a quarter days. Now that may not, a quarter of a day a year may not seem like much, but when you start talking about hundreds of years, it can make a difference. When you start talking about thousands of years from the beginning of creation, it can make a huge difference. Okay? Now, Ptolemy was a Greco-Roman mathematician, a, an astronomer, an astrologer, and he was from Alexandria, Egypt. Sound familiar? The same place that bought it, brought us the bad Bibles is the same place that Ptolemy came from. He was born in 100 AD, died in 160. Okay? Now, I have searched for this book for years. Probably can't see it on the screen. It's called The Romance of Bible Chronology by Martin Anstey. And um, you won't believe where I found this. I've seen it in the past for several hundred dollars, which was more than I was willing to spend. Um, I believe it was, I believe you sent me a PDF copy of it several years ago. Um, I found it at Walmart for 26 bucks. <laughs> So if you want one, go online at, at Walmart, now, and it's, it, I, I, think, I think this guy nailed it. I really do. And there's, I have some differences with him, but, but there's one thing, and I think that when you hear what, I, what I'm going to have to say, it'll make sense to you. Um, where am I here? Okay, here's a quote from, that, from the book that I just showed you. It says, had Ptolemy never written... Profane chronology must have remained to this day in a state of ambiguity and confusion, utterly unintelligible and useless, nor would it have been possible to have ascertained from the writings of the Greeks or from any other source except from scripture itself the true connection between sacred chronology and profane in any one single instance before the dissolution of the Persian Empire in the first year of Alexander the Great. So you see, the only way that we can connect the chronology that we have in the Old Testament up to Cyrus and the history that we have beginning at Alexander the Great is to use scripture. There is no other evidence. There's no other historical data that you can rely on. This is all we have is the Bible. Not a bad source, right? I wouldn't consider that a bad source at all. He goes on to say, uh, Ptolemy had no means of accurately determining the chronology of this period. So he made the best use of the materials he had and contrived to make a chronology. He was a great astronomer, a great astrologer, a great geographer, and a great constructor of synthetic systems. But he did not possess sufficient data to enable him to fill the gaps or to fix the dates of the chronology of this period, so he had to resort to the calculation of eclipses. In this way then, not by historical evidence or testimony, but by the method of astronomical calculation and the conjectural identification of recorded with calculated eclipses, the chronology of this period of the world's history has been fixed by Ptolemy since when, through Eusebius, 
and Jerome, it has won its way to universal acceptance. You remember Eusebius? Remember who he is? We studied him in the, in, in the, um, when we were studying the versions of the Bible. Remember who Jerome is? The guy that translated the Latin Vulgate? Catholics, right? Roman Catholics. They're the ones that accepted the canon of Ptolemy. Bishop Usher was a Roman Catholic. So of course he accepted the canon of, of Ptolemy. Now, interestingly enough, Ptolemy's canon contradicts Persian tradition and it contradicts the Jews and Josephus who lived closer to the time than, than he did. Okay, Josephus, as well as the Jews living at the time of Christ and since, agree that there were only six Persian kings, which lasted a period of 52 years, not 205 years as Ptolemy said. But that doesn't work either. Sir Isaac Newton, you've heard of him, the guy that apple fell on his head, right? He said this, he said some of them, referring to Jews, said some of them took Herod for the Messiah and were thence called Herodians. They seem to have grounded their opinion on the 70 weeks which they reckoned from the first year of Cyrus, but afterwards in applying the prophecy to Thutis and Judas of Galilee and at length to bar Kakhab, they seem to have shortened the reign of the kingdom of Persia. This explains why the Jews underestimated the duration of the Persian Empire and it shows that originally they reckoned it to be about 123 years. In other words, they knew that this prophecy was going to start with the proclamation made by Cyrus the, King, the Great and was going to end sometime during the life of the Messiah. Well, they decided that Herod was the Messiah. Therefore, we have to back into the number of years. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? If Herod's the Messiah, well, then we have to shorten the period of the Persian kings so that it fits the prophecy. Rather than just taking the prophecy for what it says, we're going to monkey with the numbers. Now, this is the kind of stuff that I used to have to see when I was an appraiser. Right? People that were backing into things and monkeying with the numbers. That's why Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac used to hire us to go after the people for committing fraud. It's the same stuff. They, well, we're going to decide that here's the starting point and we're going to end it here. Well, we got too much time. We need to shorten this up. And that's how they did it. They went into the dark period of time and shortened it up. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, um, I, Newton continued, he, he went on to say, if then the wise men from the east had heard of Daniel's prophecy and had kept an accurate account of the years, and if the Jews of Palestine were also expecting the Messiah at the very time when he was born, on the ground that it was within 33 years of the 483 predicted in Daniel, uh, for his appearance, and therefore now time for him to be born, this would indicate that they reckon the time between the first year of Cyrus and the birth of Christ as a period of roughly 450 years. And since 327 years, which is based on the history of 331 BC to BC, or, or, uh, to BC 4, from Alexander the Great to the birth of Christ, were in all probability accurately computed by the Greeks, for they began their reckoning by Olympiads within 60 years of Alexander's death, it leaves exactly 123 years for the duration of the Persian Empire, and it abridges the accepted Ptolemaic chronology by 82 years. And that's why I say that he's 82 years too long. You say, well, what difference does that make? Well, it does this. If you use Usher, who relied on Ptolemy. There's too much time between the decree of Cyrus until the time that Christ is appointed or anointed. Too many years. If your Bible says that this happened in, what was it, 538 BC, and you only got 483 years, there's too much time in there, right? So, let me make this statement also. 
prior to Usher's chronology in, in 1650, almost all conservative Bible expositors started the 70-week prophecy with the decree of Cyrus the Great. That's the natural starting point. Since Usher came along, they've begun to look for a different decree than Cyrus. Because they trust Usher that his numbers are right, and so therefore there's too much time between the decree of Cyrus and the time that Christ appears on the scene. Therefore, we have to find a different decree. Um, and that's what they do. They, most of them land on Artaxerxes the first, which is, I think it's the 20th year of his reign that they, that they land on something that they decide is the decree. And here's, what they, here's, here's their argument, and let me try to poke a hole in it, okay? And if I can't poke a hole in it, then okay, then I'm not successful in poking a hole in it. But I think I can put a, I think I can put a hole in this, the, the side that you can drive a Mack truck through. Um, those, those that rely on Usher argue that Cyrus only decreed the rebuilding of the temple, not the rebuilding of the city. Now when we get to the prophecy, you will see that it, it, it refers to a decree that restores the Jewish people back to Jerusalem again. Okay? But they argue that, well, but Cyrus's decree, and you just read, we, we read just a few minutes ago what it says from the Bible, um, that Cyrus's decree doesn't mention rebuilding anything other than the temple, just the temple. Okay? I have yet to see the full decree of Cyrus the Great. No one that has written a chronology has ever provided me with a translation of the full decree of Cyrus the Great. All we have is what the Bible mentions about a decree that was given by Cyrus the Great. How in the world do you know that he didn't give them the authorization to rebuild their houses? You can't prove it. You've never seen the decree, right? Now let me ask a couple of questions. In John chapter 2 and verse 20, John chapter 2 and verse 20, well verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? It took them forty-six years to build the temple. If they were only given permission to build the temple, where'd they live for forty-six years? Was this California? Did they have a tent city? Where in the world did they live for 46 years while they were building the, did they commute? They go back and forth between Babylon and, and Jerusalem while they're built for 46 years while they're building the temple? That doesn't seem logical to me. Um, let me ask you another question. Look at Haggai chapter one. It's over in those, when I was referring to the minor prophets. Zephaniah. Haggai, it's right after Zephaniah. Haggai chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of something, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying. Now, stay right here. I'm going to read something from Ezra. You can turn there if you want, but, but stay here because we're going to come back to this. Ezra chapter 4, verse 24, refers to this very same thing. Ezra 4, 
24 Then ceased the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius the king of Persia. So they were building the house of God and then they quit building it. Okay? In the second year of back to Haggai, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the, of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel. Verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Remember, they quit building it. We just saw that over in Ezra. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? They were living in houses, folks, and weren't building the temple and got in trouble with God because they were taking care of their own business rather than taking care of building the house of God. How can you say that there was no decree for them to restore the, the city if they had restored the city? They were living in their sealed houses. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, ye have sown much, you see, they were already living in how? Where else would they live? Of course, you're, any time that you go in on a major construction project like this, it's going to take 46 years. You have to have housing for the contractors first. There's got to be a play. There has to be infrastructure to move this stuff around. So obviously, it, obviously they, they had given permission to do that. Um, Another, here's a minor point, but I think it's, it might be a little bit, this term Artaxerxes, people like to land on Artaxerxes. You know, Artaxerxes is not a name. Artaxerxes is a title. It's a Persian title that means chief ruler. And every king that was ever a chief ruler in Persia had the name Artaxerxes. That was their title, it's like president. Artaxerxes is nothing more than like president Frank. Okay? Um, if we investigate this prophecy, when we get there, and, and again, we haven't even gotten to the prophecy yet, that's still a week, week and a half away probably, but when we get to it, it's going to become apparent, that, and, and here's the problem, this is what happens. People take Usher's chronology, they decide that there's too many years, so there has to be this other decree where am I going to go find another decree, right? When they land on the decree of Artaxerxes as the starting point, and I hate to say this, but they're giving more weight to the canon of an Egyptian astronomer than they are giving to a Hebrew prophet in the Word of God. God tells us how many years it is from the decree until the time of Christ. We need to go somewhere else? Do we really need to go somewhere else? Let me ask this question. If the decree to rebuild the city, and hence the beginning of the 70 weeks prophecy, was not the decree of Cyrus, then we got a gap of 82 years between the end of the 70 years captivity and the beginning of the 70 weeks prophecy. Does it, is a captivity over if someone says you can go home but you can't live there? Did that end the captivity? You're allowed to go home and build the temple but you can't build your own. That's not the end of a captivity, is it? Either that or the 70 year captivity hadn't even started yet. I think a lot of this is going to make, I, I'm seeing eyes glass over. I'm. I'm I think a lot of this is going to make more sense when we actually get to this and start looking at it. Um, but I'm just trying to outline the, the, the fact that I believe that this thing starts with the decree by Cyrus, the king of Persia. And that there, were, there are others that look for this other date. And you'll find it in writings and you'll find it in outlines and such. But I'm the guy that believes it was Cyrus. Um, 
when we look at this prophecy, we're going to see that Daniel had come to the conclusion by reading in the books that the 70 years captivity was coming to an end. And, we'll, and I'll, I'll show you where he got it from. It was in Jeremiah and in Isaiah. That he knew that that, said that that 70 years was almost up. And he begins to pray to God for his people as a result of the fact that he knows the 70 years is almost up. He was, all, he was already in his 80s by the time that this comes about. Are we to believe that Gabriel came to him to give him the news of the restoration and told him, you can go home, but you can't do anything for another 82 years? It doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't you just wait 82 years and go to somebody else? I, I, just, I just don't understand. How is that good news? How is it good news that your people can go back to Jerusalem, but you can't live there for 82 years, you're going to have to commute? You can build the temple, but you can't live in the city. It just doesn't make sense. Now, if we look at Usher, the time period is 82 years too long. And if we look at Josephus and the Jews, the time period is 71 years too short. How do we fit it? The only accurate and therefore acceptable method of dating that period of time is by using the prophecy in the Bible itself. And taking the, the decree that is obviously, obviously the, the decree of Cyrus, we'll look at that when we get, when we get there. Um, in other words, see, we already have a sacred chronology from the time of the creation till the first year of Cyrus. Why is that, a, why is that an important point? I just happened to think of that one. The first year of Cyrus. We're going to say that's not the decree? Well, then why don't we have chronology that goes up to the 20th year of this other guy? Why would they stop? Why would that be the breaking point, the first year of Cyrus? We have that chronology. Um, we have secular history from the end of the Persian kings and the beginning of the Greeks until the present. And we have in the prophecy in Daniel an exact period of time to fill in the balance. Why don't we just go with that? That's, that's the way that I look at this. Um, why do we need anything else? And the answer is I don't need anything else. You might, but I don't. I don't need any more than that. I'm good with the Hebrew prophet, and I'm good with the Word of God, and I prefer that rather than to a second century AD Egyptian astronomer, which is where the others get there. So when we get to this prophecy, which gives us the end of, of the 70 years captivity and the beginning of the 70 weeks until Christ, I believe the two of them happen at the same time. That the captivity ends and the 70 weeks prophecy begins. If you go with Usher, you have to say that you believe that the 70 weeks captivity ends, but the other prophecy doesn't begin again for another 82 years. And that makes no, there's nowhere in the Bible that it says anything like that. So when we get to the prophecy, I think you're going to see that these things, when one ends, the other one starts. There's not 82 years worth of a gap. And 82 years is a long time, folks. I ain't 82 years old yet. That's still years off in the future. 82 years is a bunch of years. Average lifespan of, of most folks. It's a long time. Um, now, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, you will see that the Lord marks a time frame for calculating the coming into the world of Jesus, God's Messiah. That's what that prophecy is all about. It's going to point from the time of that end of that captivity until the time that Christ is on the scene. So that you can tell, you can actually look at this and see, does it, does it fit? Why would somebody want to go change that around unless... As I was teaching way back when on my study on why the King James Bible, we have a group of people that want to destroy faith in the Bible and want to return it to the Pope. And so many fall into, fall into that trap. Um, it also describes 
In Matthew chapter 24, it also describes in the same prophecy the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 24, 34, that we referred to a, a, a Oh, yeah, where it says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. The destruction of Jerusalem happens, it's in that same prophecy. So that prophecy spans from the time that Christ comes on the scene all the way until the destruction of Jerusalem in that one, in that one prophecy. Um, how am I doing? I might be able to get this done. Um, okay, the fulfillment of such prophecies is this is clear proof of the existence, of the omniscience, of the omnipotence, and the omnipresence of the one true and living God. God makes a prophecy that is this specific. The fulfillment of it proves that it was God that gave it. So that we can then look at other prophecies that are in the Bible and understand that they were made by the same God. If this one came true as accurately as it came true, which we will look at in coming weeks, won't the others come true as well? Can't we trust God on the other prophecies that he's made? Um, Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. We read, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and shall set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid, have I not told thee from that time, and have declared it, um, ye are even my witnesses, is there a God beside me? And in Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11, we read, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Think about this prophecy of Daniel. When we get there next week, you're going to, you'll see it, and as I break it down to you, you will see that the historical record fits it exactly. That God told us 483 years before Christ's baptism exactly what was going to happen. And it happened. He even prophesied of Cyrus 180 years before that, that he would be the one that he would call on. He, he decided that he was going to be Cyrus the Great 120 years before he was even born. These, God makes these statements and then they come to pass. Why do we want to change that and make them less effective? Um, but you see, that's how, that's one of the proofs of God. One of the things that he does, Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21 through 25. He says, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things and what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show us the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and, be, and behold it together. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught and abomination is he that chooseth you. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun, uh, shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as a, uh, the uh, potter treadeth clay. This is what God does. He states the things that will happen, and then they come to pass. And the historical record shows it. And he challenges all of these other false deities, do the same thing. Tell me what's going to come to pass in the future, and then make it happen. 
Because if you can't do that, you're not God. Only God can do that, and he has done it over and over and over again. Isaiah 45, 18 through 22. For thus so saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it, not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from the time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. One of the characteristics of God is that he gives us prophecies and then he brings them to pass and we're going to be looking at one of the one of the most fabulous prophecies that he ever made because it was a prophecy that concerned when Jesus Christ would come into the world and it came to pass exactly Isaiah chapter 48 verses 3 through 5 says, I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is as an iron sinew, and thy brow, uh, bow, brow brass, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee, before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. See, that's one of the reasons he tells us what they are. So we can't attribute them to, to pagan deities. The fulfillment of prophecies that are given by God show them to be omniscient. Because you have to know all the details of an event that you foretell, otherwise you can't accurately predict them, right? You have to know it all. If he's going to give, when we look at the prophecy in Daniel, he tells us things in that prophecy. He has to know that in order to tell that so that it comes to pass. He has to be om omnipotent, which means he has to have all power over all things to be able to assure that the events that he predicts come to pass as he predicted them. He has to be omnipresent which means he has to be present everywhere so as to oversee all the details of the events that he's foretold so that they'll come to pass the way that he said they'd come to pass. And if there's one detail that the Lord does not know, one detail that he cannot control, or one detail from which he's absent, that one detail could counteract the prophecy and render it a lie. You see, by giving prophecies and bringing them about, he proves that he's God. He proves his omniscience, his omnipresence, his, that he's omnipotent. He proves that he's God by giving the prophecies. And the fulfillment of such proper prophecies is also a clear proof of God's word, the Holy Bible, in which these prophecies are recorded. This is one of the tests by which we know the Bible to be the truth. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, 21 through 22. Well, let's look at... Let's look at um, Look at verse, let's start at verse 20. Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? 
When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. See, one of the tests of a prophet is God's prophets, they don't ever miss. They never miss. They don't come out with a thus saith the Lord and something that doesn't come to pass. If they do that, they're not one of God's prophets. You don't have to pay attention to them. His prophets don't miss. Look at Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 9. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. You say, well, what's that got to do with the veracity of the Bible? Well, this is where all those prophecies are. This is where the prophets wrote them down. So, if there's something in here that doesn't add, that doesn't line up, if it fails, then the Bible's wrong. And we may as well just throw it in the trash can and go do something else. The prophecies have to be fulfilled or they're not the Word of God. If so much as one prophecy of the Bible fails to come to pass, then we can discard the Bible as fraud and not let anything it says upset us. That's why it's important that you don't start changing things around, changing what decree it was, changing this, changing that, to try to massage the thing because you don't have enough understanding as to what's going on. Micaiah, the prophet over in 1 Kings, chapter 22, And verse 28 said this. And Micaiah said, If thou return it all in peace. He had given this prophecy to, uh, um, that Ahab was going to be slain at Ramoth Gilead. That he wasn't going to make it. Wasn't going to live through it. Ahab didn't like it. But the fact of the matter was that was his prophecy. And, and he says here in verse uh, 28, If thou return it all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. See, Micaiah understood that God tells me you're going to die. If you don't die, then God didn't tell me. If a prophet says something, it comes to pass. Or it wasn't a prophecy of God. Any man that comes along and tells you something's going to come to pass and it doesn't come to pass, he wasn't a prophet of God. You don't have to worry about him. Just move on. That's the easiest way to tell. But the fulfillment of Bible prophecies, like the one that we're going to look at beginning next week, confirms our faith in the Lord, and it confirms our faith in the Bible, His Word. Look at John chapter 13. John chapter 13 and verse 19. Now I tell you before it come that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am He. You see, that's the purpose of prophecy. He'll tell you what's going to happen so that when it happens, you can look back at it and see how it fits. Now, if you tried, if you tried to take the prophecy that we're going to look at in Daniel, and you tried to stand on Daniel's side of it and look at it, it would be so confusing and dark that it would be, it'd be hard to put it together. And many people have just stumbled all over this thing and come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. But if you look at what he said and then look at the historical record, it fits together perfectly. You see, he didn't give it so you could predict the future. He gave it so that when the future was here, you could look at it and see that the prophecy fit. Therefore, God's the one that gave it. 
And that's how prophecy is supposed to be looked at. Look at uh, John chapter 14 and verse 29. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe. That's how prophecy is to be looked at. He gives us the prophecy, then we look, we see, whoa, look at that. It's fulfilled. Or it isn't. Okay. Now with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this morning. I've I actually finished... Uh, actually finished the introduction. Probably went a little longer than I intended to, but we got, the, uh, we got the intro done, and next week we'll pick up with the time frame of Daniel's prayer, and we'll start looking at Daniel chapter 9 and the, and the 70 weeks prophecy. With that, I thank you for your very kind and patient attention this morning. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.